Good, my rare nerds. It is I. We will be covering The Lost Universe, which is a tabletop RPG one-shot adventure designed by none other than NASA. I've actually played it, and in this video I will talk you all through my experience. But before I take one small step for the video, and one big leap for the channel, I have three buttons that are lovely if you'd click, and those are like, subscribe, and the bell for notifications. I'm going to divide this video into two halves. The first is an overview of what's actually in the book, and the second half will be the numerous changes that I made and the experience that I had running this adventure. So, what do we have here? The Lost Universe is a 44-page e-booklet that you can download from the NASA website. I have a link to it below. It says that it's system neutral, but it also says that it's meant for 4-7 to seven players of 7-10th to tenth level. And that is where we come to the first of many issues with this adventure. System neutral and specified levels do not mix at all. First off, not every tabletop RPG has levels, and even those that do have levels don't always agree on what they mean. In D&D 5e, for instance, which this adventure is clearly meant to be played with, even though they never outright state it, 7th to 10th level represents the middle to upper end of tier 2, where the characters are meant to be region level heroes. In a system like 13th Age, 7th to 10th level represents the top of the champion tier and the entirety of the epic tier. This is endgame stuff. As I said, this is clearly meant to be used with D&D 5e, and I strongly suspect that the term system neutral is really only there so that NASA didn't have to mess around with the open game license. Which, honestly, I don't blame them. The next thing I'd like to point out here is that by modern standards, 4 to 7 players is a bloody massive group. Most RPG adventures written nowadays are intended for groups of 3 to 5 players, and some are meant for single or two player play. While certainly a lot of the early AD&D modules were intended for huge groups, there has been a pretty fundamental shift in the culture of play since then, and so that specified number of players really stuck out to me. Now mercifully, when I ran this, I found exactly 4 players, which is more than I was expecting to, mind you. And of course, given this is a very vague system neutral adventure, these level and player guidelines are just that, they're guidelines. You don't have to follow them. If you have a two-player group, you can adapt this adventure to a two-player group. The only question is whether you'd want to. So, what is it all about? The Lost Universe is all about the Hubble Space Telescope, as well as being about a planet called Exlaris that is supposedly like Earth, however, it is not part of any solar system. It is a rogue planet that was pulled out of its solar system by the gravitational influence of a passing black hole. This is an actual thing that can happen, and it's neat to see them use some level of physics correctly, because oh my, is that not gonna last. Now, as the little war rundown at the start of this adventure tells us, the various inhabitants of Exaris did not have a great time when their access to stable light and heat was taken away from them. And this event that happened many centuries ago was called the Breaking. In order to prevent their planet from just shedding its atmosphere and turning into a dark, empty wasteland that could not support any life, the most intellectually gifted of the planet's inhabitants banded together and harnessed something called the energy of the vacuum. That is all that it's ever called in the adventure. And if you're wondering what it is, good question. The adventure doesn't tell you, partly because how it works is unknown to the characters in setting, and also because I'm pretty sure that whoever designed this didn't know either. There is some talk later on in the adventure about dark energy, as well as certain unique qualities of true vacuum that could be extrapolated maybe into this stuff, but really they wanted an excuse to put D&D magic into a pseudoscientific world, and this is what they picked. Whether it was a smart decision is up to you. So, having been through this brutal experience of using magic to rebuild the atmosphere using an artificial magic barrier, and creating basically magic sun lamps over each of the major cities to provide some level of illumination, the various scholars, majors, and academics all banded together to unite the planet in glorious pursuit of scientific research for the betterment of their denizens. Or so the adventure would have us believe. Indeed, the five surviving cities of the planet of Exolaris each have their own academic specialty. Aldastrin specializes in astrophysics, this is the setting of the adventure. There is Sarthelios, which specializes in solar science. There is Pescaparea, which specializes in biological sciences. Peleridon is the epicenter of planetary science. And Alcatnum is the abode of aeronautics. And now some of you may be noticing that a few key fields are missing from this list. Most notably chemistry, engineering, and anything resembling the social sciences. Now why does that matter? 
Oh, we'll get to that. We don't get too much more detail on how these cities function. We do know they have general universities that cover most fields of education, beyond the city-specific specialties. We know that the five cities are linked by teleportation portals, and we know that the cities are all governed by academics. About Aldastrin specifically, we know that there is a town guard, and that they wear dark blue uniforms so that they can blend into the background and move around in secret. Now, I don't know if the designers meant for this to be the case, but it is very clear that none of these cities are democracies. It is also strongly implied that Aldastrin, at the very least, has everything that it would need to form an authoritarian police state. The adventure keeps trying to convince us that these cities are enlightened, that they are dedicated to the betterment of their citizens, but really, the incentive structure here is for a bunch of ivory tower academics to fritter away the wealth of their cities on highly speculative research with no higher accountability and an iron shod boot to deal with anyone who complains. This does not make me think of some glorious outer space utopia. It makes me think of Italian factory riots in 1919, and the disgruntled war veteran named Benito who took advantage of them. But you know what? If scientifically accurate academic fascism is what you want, men frego. Do whatever. I know I'm being a bit snarky here, but I genuinely don't see how the society would be beneficial for the populace. For one thing, anyone who wanted political power would have to go through academia first, which means you'd have a substantial portion of academics who didn't want to be there, didn't want to be teaching or doing research, and were just using it as a proxy for power. On the other hand, you'd always have a bunch of academics who were there to teach and do research, being pushed into political roles they were completely unfit for. Honestly, you'd be lucky to make any of this work. But enough about the world building, let's get on with the adventure. The story setup is that the Hubble Space Telescope has vanished. And not just vanished, completely disappeared from our timeline. Nobody remembers it ever existing. And yet somehow the player characters are scientists who are meant to have been working on the Hubble Space Telescope. How removing the Hubble from the timeline did not also remove the decision to hire them from the timeline is beyond me. How removing the Hubble from the timeline did not create the desire to make a new, different space telescope with a different name is also beyond me. Seriously, to any aspiring adventure designers out there, do not mess with time travel unless you really know what you're doing. And whoever wrote this didn't. But that's past the point. The setup is that the PCs are all scientists at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, who have spent several weeks with a feeling of malaise until one day, as they set off for a group meeting, they are suddenly transported to a magical, mystical world. That is something like a bus stop. I am not joking. After their magical transportation from Earth to Exlaris, the first place that they arrive at is described as like a bus stop. Reading down a bit further, we do learn that there are a series of portals, above which are names like Sarthelios, Vesca Perea, Arketnum. Remember those? This is not a bus stop, this is a teleportation station. It is nothing like a bus stop. At a bus stop, you stand by a bench and wait for a bus to come by. At a teleportation stop, there is a 24-hour fully active portal that you can walk through at any freaking time. This annoys me so much that I forgot to mention that in the course of the transportation, the player characters go from being very average NASA scientists to between 7th and 10th level fantasy adventurers with all the strange races and classes that you might expect. Elves, halflings, tieflings, although no dwarves, interestingly. I wonder what happened to them. But having remembered that one detail, I have another rant to go on, because there's another issue here. What is the technology level of this world? Seriously, what is it? I don't know. D&D 5e does a very poor job of defining this, which is not helping this module in any way, but all of sci-fi RPGs actually have codified systems for describing tech levels. In both Traveller and Stars Without Number, this is literally called the tech level, the TL. Now bear in mind, Stars Without Number uses a much vaguer system than Traveller, with much fewer steps between the different levels of technology, but there is some effort to describe the progression from Stone Age, to Bronze Age, to Iron Age, to Medieval Technology, to Renaissance, to Industrial, to Modern, to many, many levels of bizarre sci-fi tech. None of that is here. The module talks about a bus stop, but I have no idea if they have the technology for working buses. If they can build internal combustion engines, steampunk engines, energy of the vacuum engines, I don't know what they can do. It's kind of a mess, and it will only get worse. But, as this round ends, the PCs have a chance to look around and to see various interesting items. There is a notice board with an I lost my cat poster for four academics. There is also a tavern, which some passing NPCs express a desire to visit. And there are, of course, the creepy patrolling guards lurking in the shadows. 
And from here, the PCs can go in one of two directions. They can go into the tavern and meet two NPCs called Damien and Fairwin. They are two former academics who now run a tavern together, with Fairwin being the one in charge. And from here, they can learn about the story setup. Alternatively, they can be picked up by guards and taken to a certain Captain Roxana Traven, and again, learn the setup of the adventure. For the most part, these two branching paths of the adventure are basically identical except for the coat of paint. The only real difference is that at the start of the tavern path, a bunch of NPCs start a bar brawl over whatever caused those researchers to go missing. Really. I'm serious. A bunch of random, ordinary people who presumably have food expenses, mortgages, jobs, families, interpersonal dramas, have taken time out of their busy drinking schedule to start a bar brawl over the disappearance of a couple of researchers. Now, to be fair, people do get into arguments over current events all the time. But a bar brawl? Really? How important are academic researchers in this world to the average person? But yes, apparently in this process, 1D4 brawlers break off and attack the PCs for reasons, and Damien asks the PCs to break up the fight without calling the guards in for reasons. Now, I should note something. This is a 7th to 10th level adventure. Assuming D&D 5e, then even the weakest of wizards will realistically have at least 26 HP, and the highest level barbarians could comfortably have more than 120 HP. Any spellcasters will also very likely have access to third level spells like Fireball that do area of effect damage. 1d4 random tavern brawlers will not do anything against them. The question is not how many rounds it would take the PCs to do this fight, it'll be how many turns. Now as a GM you would have the right to make these the biggest, beefiest bar brawlers that have ever been, but it would also be wildly unrealistic. Seriously, what were they thinking? Now, either way, whichever path you take, because while there are choices in this adventure, none of them matter, the PCs will have it explained to them that a certain Iric Hazen summoned them using a spell from their planet to help recover and potentially repair the Hubble Space Telescope, but that Iric and three other researchers have gone missing. This, of course, leads to the overwhelming urge for them to be found. One thing that I don't really like here is that there isn't really any sense of personal stakes or urgency to this whole situation. The player characters have an unlimited time limit to find an object that none of them can remember exists, and that potentially none of them personally care about, and so there's a decent chance of the PCs just going, yeah, no, we'd rather just wander around old Astron. Why do we care? But if the players do what the module assumes they will and decide that they do want to be a part of this whole shenanigans, they will be sent along to Old Astron's observatory campus, which we do get a bit of a description for. It's got a neat spiral pattern with all the buildings, which is nice, and by some means or other they are brought along to encounter the head researcher of the observatory, a certain Dr. Morgan Sherry, they, them. This is probably the best time to point out that yes, the NASA team, the designers, have made every effort to make this adventure as racially gender inclusive as possible. Some of you will like this, some of you won't. It's entirely up to you. Now, getting back to the action, Professor Sherry will basically repeat everything that has already been said to the player characters. Yeah, a lot of the first part of this adventure is literally just the GM sitting around yammering. It is painfully tedious. From here, there will be an investigation. Well, not much of one. Very quickly, Professor Sherry will lead them along to a projected contraption, don't ask how it works, don't ask what it is, with a dial on it. After a quick info dump about how red and blue shifts work, which, as the module explains, blue stars are generally younger and hotter, while red are older and colder, I hope I got that the right way around this time, because when I ran this adventure, I got it the wrong way around. Whoops. Anyway, they'll be invited to twist a knob back and forth through the red and blue spectrums of light to see how red and blue shifting works. If they shift it one way, they will see a secret message saying Hubble found, and if they shift it another way, they will see a message saying go to Moxana. Previous to this, they will have heard a number of rumours about a place called Moxana and the ruins and the strange stuff going on there. So to be honest, they don't really need this clue to find things, and it's a very strange clue to begin with. For instance, why did Professor Sherry not muck about with a knob before? Professor Sherry clearly calls out in the text that the patterns seem unfamiliar to them, and so quickly playing with their knob would probably be on the cards. That's getting taken out of context, isn't it? And that's basically it in terms of things the players need to do. There are a few perception and insight checks they can make here and there in the first half of the adventure, maybe a persuasion check or two if they really want one, but a lot of it is just being led around and talked to. There is one last section talking about globular clusters and gravitational lensing, where they are shown what I am told is a 1960s computer that has a monitor and a big tower thing under the desk. That is how the module describes it pretty much. Now, 
As it happens, my grandmother worked in a computer centre in Bulgaria in the 1960s. Well, specifically the late 1960s, because there were no computers in Bulgaria until even the mid-1960s. But from what she's told me, these were entirely mechanical mainframes, they had no electronics, and they took up the size of a room. The only interface you had for them was punch cards. If you don't know what these are, I will put some images up on slide. And to hear her tell it, they didn't get electronic mainframe computers that still took up the size of a room for very limited computational power until about 1975. Now to be fair, the Western world was ahead of the Eastern Bloc technologically for quite a bit of the 20th century. However, even then, I will find some examples of American 1960s computers, and they are not nearly as advanced as what is described here. Seriously, get your technology strict. You have the institutional legacy of an organization that was working with computers in the 1960s because they put one in the body Saturn V rocket. How do you confuse a 1960s computer for what sounds like a 2000s era computer? What is going on? Anyway, Professor Sherry info dumps about globular clusters and how they cause gravitational lensing. As I said, that one of my players made the argument to the group that gravitational lensing does not exist. And even sent me a link to a video by the Thunderbolts Films YouTube channel, which I will link down below, going over the argument against it. We don't have time for this here, I'm not going to pass judgement on whether gravitational lensing is a real phenomenon or not, because I am not a physicist, I'm a linguist, and I don't have the qualification to be going into all of this. The whole point of this section is that Professor Sherry shows the player characters a miniaturised gravitational lens thing that can be used to see at long distances, but not into places where the adventure doesn't want you to see or it spontaneously becomes fuzzy. Now, what this sounds like is basically space magic binoculars. Why they couldn't have given you normal binoculars is beyond me. But regardless, Professor Sherry gives the players a mini gravitational lens and a potion of superior healing and sends them off on their way for the 30 mile trek to Moxana. That's a pretty short distance from a major inhabited city to haunted abandoned ruins, but oh well. And of course most of the adventure up to this point has been describing how dark and dangerous it is in the lightless land beyond the cities. All the strange horrors and monstrosities that dwell there. And so we're expecting to have an epic little wilderness exploration section. Except no we aren't. The entire process of travelling more Dastrin to Moxana can be summarised in one sentence if you want it to be. From there, the PCs will find their way to an area called Red Willow Wood, and they can either enter an abandoned prison or an abandoned library. One way, they pass through a blue shift red shift puzzle with some blue and red flames, where the blue flames will burn them because they're younger and hotter, and the red flames won't because they're older and colder. These flames are neat little archways, and whichever one you go through, you end up in the same path either way. I should note, the blue flames cause 1d6 fire damage apparently. 1d6 fire damage against a 7th level character. That can be healed with a healing word. That is inconsequential damage. On the other hand, if you go the other way, you find a globular cluster gravitational lensing puzzle. There is also a spear trap, which has 6 projectiles that will do 1d6 damage again. What is it with the 1d6 damage? Come on. And also has an illusory wall with a pattern of a globular cluster. Using the gravitational lens thingy will reveal that it is an illusory wall, and that there is a path beyond it. But so will sticking your hand through the wall. What is the point of this puzzle? What is going on here? Who designed this? Ah, oh, I'm starting to think the moon landings really were faked. Either way, the PC's paths will converge on the lair of a young green dragon named Asilius that stole the Hubble Space Telescope to use for herself. To do this, Asilius polymorphed herself into a very green-skinned female elf and went around engaging in shenanigans in Ordastron. There is some hinting of this in the first section with Dr. Sherry, but there is no indication whatsoever that they're about to fight a dragon, which they will. After that, they can free the four researchers and return both themselves and the Hubble back to Earth. Phew! Overall, in terms of what's presented here, I am not happy. There are so many issues with this, from the linearity, broken up only by fairly meaningless false choices, the fact that all the NPCs that we're presented with are one-dimensional. Isilius is completely covetous. Professor Sherry is completely helpful. Ziania Hesk, one of the researchers, is completely enthusiastic. Captain Treban is completely dutiful. There is no nuance or depth to these characters. There are also some glaring faults with the science and technology of this world. Again, I don't know what the tech level is meant to be. How do these sunlight lamps work, and how do they work for agriculture? I point out that second bit because any sun lamp near the surface of Exolaris will be limited in its range by the curvature of the surface of Exolaris. And farms, for those of you who don't know, take up a lot of space. It takes a lot of land to feed an entire city. So how are they getting the light to these guys? It occurred to me the morning after I ran this scenario that you could, say, have glowy satellites floating around in their own little orbits. But a quick Google search suggests that a low Earth orbit only has a maximum period of about two hours for an Earth-like planet. So I will leave the exact solution up to you guys. 
I couldn't find a good one. But I did still want to run this. One, because I knew I wanted to make a video about it and I didn't want that video to be uninformed. And two, because in space, no one can hear my player scream. And so I got to the setup. Ahead of time, I made four pre-generated characters for my four players, and these were all NASA team members. There was a physicist, an engineer, a research assistant, and a diversity hire. Each of them had names, pronouns, personality traits, and a homebrew class of random joke abilities. The physicist had special abilities relating to Newton's three laws of motion, one called Autistic Deep Diver, and the most infamous, the aura of sexual repulsion. The engineer had the ability to inflict levels of exhaustion just by talking, along with a few other quirky abilities. The research assistant could remove things like the charmed and frightened conditions by doing <coughs> research. And the diversity hire had the ability to cancel people, getting them fired, regretted on social media, debanked, and even causing up to 60 10 psychic damage. I made these abilities up as jokes and I had no intention of them actually being used, as the PCs wouldn't be using these sheets for very long. This is where we come to my first big change. I removed the whole time travel element. The Hubble Space Telescope just disappeared one day after 3 a.m. Everyone knew it existed before, all of its impact on humanity had been realized, but it would have no future impact. And importantly for the PCs, without a Hubble for them to work on, their jobs were about to disappear. But good news, as they were gathering for a moral support picnic, a massive truck hit them, smashing them all head on and properly eviscerating them. Listen. This adventure is basically an isekai, so I couldn't help giving them a date with a great and beautiful truck coon. My regular weekly campaign is Cyberpunk Red. I can hit PCs with trucks as often as I want, but hitting them with truck coon is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Now once the transportation process began and the PCs were brought all the way over to Exolaris, they actually found themselves in not a like a bus stop, but in an actual teleportation station, which was properly described, I even had a map for them to look at to help give them an actual sense of what things were meant to be like. I should note that I set the tech level as vaguely clockpunk renaissance and did everything I could to enforce this, including removing the anachronistic computers from later on. After their transformation, the diversity hire became a ninth level fighter, the physicist a ninth level wizard, the engineer a ninth level cleric, and the researcher a ninth level rogue. My players had no idea what their classes would be when they picked their characters, which led to a fun little moment as the rogue player realised that no, he would not get any spells for this one shot. Once he realised what rogues could do, he stopped complaining. Next up, I just gutted the guard slash tavern section. It doesn't need to be there. All of the information that those NPCs give can be given by Professor Sherry, especially since Captain Treban, Damien and Failwin will never be used by the adventure again, at least not in any meaningful way. So I had a bunch of guards pick them up from the teleportation station and just bring them straight to the observatory. From there I changed the weird projector thing with the blue and red shifts very slightly. Rather than having a bunch of word messages appear, I had in one case a schematic of the Hubble appear, and in the other a map of Moxana with a giant X on it appear. This then required them to actually figure out what the maps were meant to be, and I also also had Professor Sherry be out of the room and the projector in question be in Dr. Eric Hazard's desk to remove any chance of Professor Sherry having interacted with it previously and thus you know spoiling the whole point. That being said there was only so much I could do to fix this. The biggest changes that I made to this adventure was to the section of the end of part one to the start of part two. I actually added stuff there. I added three little encounters. The first was just some guards hailing them on the road. The next was a pair of Babau demons. Now, I'm not really messed around a lot with the fiend stat blocks in D&D 5e, but I really like the Babau. It's got some nice resistances, some nice skills, a lot of at-will spells like Darkness and Levitate. The Weakening Gaze ability is honestly a bit crap, but overall this was a decent fight. Except for the fact that Babau's have resistance to non-magical damage, and I, for some reason, did not give any of the pregens a single magic weapon. Whoopsie. So yeah, that fight took a little longer than it should have, but you know what, I do like the Babau. In the horrifying event that I ever have to play D&D 5e again, I will be using more of them. A highlight of the Babau fight was that uh, right at the start, the wizard managed to successfully telekinesis one Babau into the air and keep it from harming anyone else. The cleric then cast a gesture on this demon, forcing it to actually protect the PCs from the other Babau. I allowed this on the basis that the Babau thought, you know what, probably better to have all these PCs as food for myself. And so, accordingly, the now suggested demon cast a levitate, which it can do at will, on the other Babau, and suddenly, both of the demons were levitating. After this moment, not a single incident of telekinesis or levitation worked again, but there was a truly glorious little vignette. The third encounter was an area of dense swampland, which the PCs had to use a skill challenge to navigate. There was meant to be a fourth encounter involving four ogre zombies, but I ended up cutting it for time. 
when they actually arrived at Moxana, I had the two archway blue red thing and the globular cluster puzzle be on the same linear path because I wanted to use both and I just don't like false choices, there's no point having them. This is already a linear adventure, just admit it already. And now we come to the final section. You see, there's one key detail that I added, but I didn't mention up to now because honestly I forgot to, but we'll cover it now, because why not? And that is, I added an extra NPC to this whole thing. A certain Dr. Nort Alfaris. Nort was a researcher, although really he preferred politics to research, because if academics are the government, the people into government will go into academia. And he had been wanting to use the Hubble. But Dr. Eirik, not really liking him, thinking he was too corrupt, did not let him get access to the Hubble via the magic spell that Dr. Eirik had to access its findings. Oh yeah, that's a detail that's in this whole thing. Somehow they were able to perform long distance contact with the Hubble Space Telescope for months and months to collect research data from Exolaris. Now, our good friend Nort here could not do that himself, as he didn't know the spell, but he gave it his best shot, and instead of contacting the Hubble, he contacted a TV news satellite, and was promptly bombarded with the knowledge that he meant he were a bunch of warmongering racists, because what else was a news satellite going to tell him? Accordingly, he thought that humanity did not deserve the Hubble, and he conspired with Asilius to steal the Hubble so that they could use it together. And so rather than fighting a lone green dragon, they fought a green dragon plus a wizard with night level spell slots plus two research assistants because I wanted two research assistants. This fight was brutal. It actually started off well enough for the PCs when they managed to trap both Asilius and Nort in some of our black tentacles. Unfortunately for them, the party fighter, the diversity hire, crit failed her saving throw against Asilius' poison breath and the cleric was disintegrated by Nort's disintegrate spell. Despite this, they bravely fought through, and once the fighter had nat 20 her death save and recovered, she was able to rejoin, and they defeated all the enemies in only a couple of rounds. And from there, they all lived happily ever after, actually staying on Exolaris because they realised that, turns out, a world that prioritises academia above everything else is a really great place to be an academic. Now, overall, the opinion from my players was mixed. Most of them enjoyed it. One of them actually sent me a little message saying, hey, thanks for the adventure. And one of them was full of complaints. Personally, in terms of my own closing thoughts, this adventure was an absolute hot mess. There are so many issues here, many of which I mentioned and some that I've forgotten about. Oh yeah, another issue. Very inconsistent character descriptions. Some characters get full detailed physical descriptions, some get partial descriptions with say, hair style, not hair colour, and some are described only by alignment and pronouns. I'm not even joking. And of course, I do all have personalities, but those are always one note. Honestly, whoever designed this adventure had no idea what they were doing, they clearly had no experience writing adventures, and so the result was absolutely abysmal. As you can see, I did make efforts to try and change things and to fix things where I could, but honestly, this module was so broken I didn't know how to fix it. I did think like, you know, trying to add a wilderness segment to actually make the wilderness feel dangerous, but it only worked so well. I tried to change the globular cluster puzzle by having the gravitational lens, rather than revealing that the wall was illusory, instead revealed that a small section was illusory, behind which was concealed a lever, to open a panel in the wall. Again, didn't make a huge bit of difference. There were some things like adding the joke abilities at the start, but yeah, I'm really not happy with how this went. In terms of things I could do better next time, I made a real effort to get through this whole thing in one four hour session. When really I probably should have split this over two three hour sessions. One to give myself more time, and two to give myself a chance to change my notes for session two based on feedback from session one. But alas, I chose not to do that. Overall, I do not recommend The Lost Universe to anybody who wants to try it. While it is free, you may end up leaving wanting a refund. As for NASA, my advice is this. First off, the next time you do something like this, hire a freelancer. There are so many of them out there in the tabletop RPG world, and it is embarrassing how low their rates are. Get a professional in for this. Second, while the Hubble Space Telescope is an interesting part of NASA's history, it has genuinely contributed to humanity's understanding of the world. It's really not the most interesting thing that NASA has done, and there is so much more that NASA could bring to the table. In terms of better ideas than weird, badly defined isekai space fantasy, NASA could have given us like a gritty, hard sci-fi space exploration game that's all about, you know, how rockets and unmanned explorers and all that fun stuff work. Or they could have made a survival horror game about trying to colonize Mars. If they really wanted fantasy races and magic, they could have gone science fantasy again on Mars. And I say on Mars so that you can have an organization called the Knights of Sidonia. If you don't get that reference, what are you doing with your life? But yeah, really, the biggest disappointment here is, of all the things we could have had from NASA, this is what we got. A fumbling adventure about, at best, the third or fourth most interesting thing that NASA does on a regular basis.
But as has long been tradition for my group, we do have our Out of Context Discord channel with all the funniest things that we said during the game. And now I will read you some of them. I'm glad she thinks I'm a better virgin. Ah, uh, my immediate suspicion is you're just going to post dick pics at this point. I don't mind being that bitch. I'm a woman! Am I the only white guy? I'm probably gonna die first. I'm the only one who's actually here on merit. Oh god, this is a D&D game. Fuck me. I don't have lube anymore. I always knew I was sexy on the inside. That's not very consensual. I want to find the guy who hit me with a truck. Slaves. I mean undergrads. I mean TAs. I am not calling you doctor. No, Mr. Sir, Madam, They, Them. If it is blue, it is hotter and younger. If it is red, it is colder and older. Yay, death! Give me one second to do... Nothing, honestly. Don't worry about it. She might kill me, but she's pretty. And it's a wrap. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please like it, share it with your friends, and leave a comment down below. What fixes would you suggest for this adventure? Do you think it can be fixed at all? If you'd like to see more videos like this one, then please subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. It really does help my ego. I mean the channel, but also my ego. And once more, thank you all so much for watching, and until I see you next, farewell.